I, I want everybody to wait before you sit down. And you will not sit there all night long. If you've been to one of my meetings, you do not sit there all the time. <clears throat> because the Father sends me to train you, yes. not just to tell you something. And I believe if you're going to receive something from God, if you're going to declare and decree in heaven, in the throne room, you always stand when you declare and decree. And so I do what they do in the throne room. And so that's why I'll have you stand up sometimes. And I'm very serious about the things I have you de declare and decree. And if you hear me say the Father wants to do this or that in your life or right now on the earth, I want to hear you say, I receive it. Let me hear everybody say that. I receive it. You have not because you ask not. And just because you're listening doesn't mean you get it. And one of the ways they get in heaven, and I know you may say, what does that mean? Well, you don't have to worry about praying for people, you know, to be healed up there, be de delivered, or they're not in lack or anything. But they declare things over the earth all the time. And your families in heaven declare over you all the time. And so you need to learn that whenever you hear anyone say something, God is doing this today in the earth. He wants his body to do this. He wants you to know this. He's releasing this in the earth. I want to hear you say, I receive it. Because when you say that, he writes it down. You know, he has a book of remembrance. He has many different books in heaven. And he has books of consecration. He has books for the kingdom age. He has books for ruling and reigning. And whenever I have you declare and decree things, uh, establishing something in heaven for you on the earth because you've said yes. And I know they've been talking in these meetings about saying yes. And, and right now, things are happening that never happened before. And you do have to say yes. In case you don't remember, when you, when you, when you wanted Jesus, right? Did you invite him into your heart? Yes. Okay. And when you ask Holy Spirit to indwell you, did you invite him? Yes. Well, this is a season in the kingdom age where you will invite many other things to be a part of your life or be part of your team. One of them is the host of heaven. If you don't know who the hosts of heaven are, uh, it is heaven's army. And they are not defending heaven. That war took place a long time ago and the devil lost. Then he lost again in hell. He's going to lose right now. And one of your weapons, I'm starting the way the Holy Spirit wants to. Um, the, you need to know that in this kingdom time on the earth, you're going to hear a lot about the kingdom, but not just here. You're going to see it actively living and alive on the earth, releasing things from heaven, imparting things from heaven, demonstrating and manifesting supernatural things to release heaven in the earth. And you have a new weapon. And they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds in your life. And I know that we are charting our course for this kingdom time on the earth, not just for 2016, but for the rest of your existence on planet earth. That's what you're receiving here. This stuff is powerful. You do have to do things in the natural. And if you don't have your natural life in order and you don't have things set in place for your everyday life and where you're going with God and what you want to do with God, then entering into the spirit realm will not work for you. I will tonight be talking about charting your course to, uh, to maneuver in the spirit realm. And you do that in a starship. There are many ways to be transported, you know, and, and I prefer starships. <laughs> you're like, what's that? The spirit realm is not a person. It's not just a place. It is literally another whole world. Uh, it, it's space that has always existed before the physical realm was here. And we as believers, and who've invited Jesus Christ in our life, we get to rule and reign with him. But the platform we use and will navigate in for that is in the spirit realm. Uh, you can't do that if you don't have flesh, by the way. So everyone here, if you have flesh in your body, raise your hand and wave at me. And you have received Jesus Christ, wave it again. Then you qualify. You only get dominion in this earth if you have flesh on your body and you're a believer. So you qualify. Those who do not qualify are the demonic 
are the army of darkness. They have no right unless people give their lives to him and create a space or a place for them to operate in. And we're not going to allow that in our lives, are we? So guess who has authority? We do. Say, we do. we do. Say it loud. We do. Now you sound like an army. <laughs> So you have to realize one of the things I'll be talking about tonight and tomorrow night is moving and navigating in the spirit realm. And I'm so glad everybody talked about charting your life and getting your life in order. I love what Matt said about, hey, you do not know what it's like to be in the ministry. Everybody says, I want to be you. And I want, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> not really, but you can be. <laughs> you can be everything God called you to be. You, and you can be powerful. And God wants you born again. I love that term. He wants you born again into a new creation, carrying his DNA and his glory. He wants you to do that. He wants the Holy Spirit to be your very best friend who will tweak you your entire life and get in your face all the time and talk to you 24-7. Yeah. But what he really wants you to be is dangerous. Yeah. We are supposed to be dangerous against evil. Okay? They are supposed to fear us. The only ones who are supposed to fear is the army of darkness, and that's because of the body of Christ ruling and reigning with him. All right? So uh, now you can sit down. <laughs> and uh, it's going to always be different wherever I go. Do you like my hair? Yeah. This is heaven culture. This is heaven culture. It's also a test to see who's in the flesh and who's in the spirit. And the Holy Spirit told me that. And one day, he showed me one day, pastors, well-known pastors, will walk out on their platform with green spikes in their hair or blue or purple highlights or both. And it will be to see who's operating in the flesh and who's operating in the spirit. Because there will be people in the flesh who do not like the fact that their pastor now has green in their hair like it automatically changed who they were. It does not make any difference in who I am on the inside because of what I have in my hair. It's no different than wearing a pink hat a pink scarf, it is heaven culture, and they love color. God did make the rainbow, correct? Your clothes change color in heaven. It makes music in heaven. Uh, the trees sing to you. They have uh, beings made out of light, rainbow light. I've seen angelic beings made out of all the colors of the rainbow, and they, and they move with the energy of that rainbow that moves from the Father. Color is huge in heaven. There's colors here that don't exist on this earth. But you can have them come through your home. And so we're in a new whole, we're in a whole new age. And this is a new season in a new age. And within an age, there will be seasons. There will be fullness of times. Those are terms that heaven uses. On God's timeline. He has his own timeline. He does not go by ours. He certainly does not go by the Mayans or none of us would be here. <laughs> and at one point last year, my clock, I have a beautiful clock on my wall and thunder struck. Thunder, not lightning. The clock flew off the wall and smashed. And God said, man's time is no more. This is my time to have things my way and my will being done in my children on the earth. And I will give you a brand new revelation he gave me just the other night. And I was talking about his ways and his thoughts because everybody always says, you know, his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts and we can't have them. He didn't say you couldn't have them. You just don't understand them. And I will let you know why he says that because he is not normal. This is what he told me. My thoughts are strange. And my ways are strange. <laughs> and people don't like that. It's too bad. And it's too late. Because you're living in his time right now. 
So get ready for him to ask you to do the most unusual, uncomfortable, inconvenient, strange things you've ever done in your life. If they don't make any sense to your natural mind, then that's definitely God. He wants you to die. You're in the school of dying. I died. I look pretty good, don't I? <laughs> I'm the freest I've ever been in my life when you die completely to yourself and you literally surrender, lay down your life and you find it in him. It is a fun place to be because Jesus is a very fun person. Let me tell you, give you a clue. Sinners liked him. That should tell you right there. He was fun to be around. They liked him, but he didn't never sin. He didn't partake of their sin, but they sure liked him because he was, ex he was exciting, he was unusual, and he, he did a lot of fun things. He played pranks on the disciples. I had seven brothers. I know males. And when you get a bunch of guys together, they're nuts. They do crazy things. They pull pranks on each other. Uh, they want to outdo each other. And I can tell you it was Jesus and his merry men. It really was. Uh, Jesus was captivating. He was an irritation to the religious hierarchy of the day because not only was he holy and powerful, he had more fun than all of them. And they thought you shouldn't have fun. Well, fun is half of heaven. If you are going to live heaven culture on this earth, you better be having fun. And since I made that statement, please stand up. How many people would like to have some fun? Don't ever say you can't afford something again. Amen. Heaven's not broke. Amen. It's not broke. So we're going to look up and say, Father, Father I, am I am your child. I really, really, I really, really need, to have fun. need to have fun. So open doors, open doors. So, I so I can have fun and enjoy it. And enjoy so it. I receive it. Right now. right now. Amen. Amen. Sit down. <laughs> now, now you have already asked him for something tonight. And because you've asked for it, I've, I should actually, if I ever had time, would read emails from people. I've got stacks of them of how their entire life and their future is being changed by revelation about who they really are. You are powerful. You are so powerful. You have more power in one little fingernail than all of hell. They're so afraid you're going to find out who you are. And you might actually start taking power and authority over all of them. Sicken the host of heaven on them to pull all the strongholds down. <laughs> That's still not my message. <laughs> I have long introductions. Because this year will be 20 years that he's been taking me to heaven. Nonstop. Almost every day. And it's not for me. I've never seen my mansion. Uh, the only thing I've ever seen was some of my pets I had. Yes, your pets go to heaven. And I want to ask this because I know some people don't care and think God doesn't care. How many people here are happy your pets go to heaven? There's your answer. He delights to bless you, and so get ready. They're there running your mansion, taking over your mansion. Your cats will give you permission to live with you because cats are very territorial. Your dogs are greeting everybody else, all the neighbors, the new people who come. They've made best buddies with other dogs in heaven, but the cats will stay on your property. And uh, I like to laugh, but I'll warn you, your, your animals, your pets, will no longer eat out of a bowl on the floor. They already have a seat at your table, and you will not make them move. And they will have conversations with you. If the trees in the forest of heaven can talk to you, and the waterfalls can talk to you, and the flowers sing, your pets can talk. And if you have a dog that never stopped barking, good luck. 
because he was trying to communicate with you right here on this earth. And now they will never shut up for all eternity. And I have seen every kind of pet in heaven. So there they are. Because God loves you. And he said the pets deserve to be there. That's why he put more animals on the ark than people. <laughs> Think about it. Is that true? Yes. They weren't cursing God. <laughs> In the Garden of Eden, when he first made them, they were not even made to be, um, you know, they weren't animals for labor or burden when he put them there. They were there to be friends with Adam. When he called them by name, he didn't say, you're a horse, you're a dog, you're a cat. He had names for them, called them by name, and they answered. And that's why they weren't uh, upset when the snake talked to them. By the way, who wants some, a little bit of revelation on that snake? He had to give permission for Satan to possess them. Because back then they could say yes or no. Uh, even the animals knew who God was. They knew he created them. They had a greater understanding. They all had the ability to talk back then. And that's why that snake was cursed, which caused that curse to fall on every other snake. I, I've seen snakes in heaven and they walk. They walk. They weren't cursed in heaven, okay? All animals, uh, all kinds of animals are in heaven. But the ones on the earth were cursed because of what that one snake did. Just like mankind was cursed because of the decision Adam and Eve made. Oh, I have more revelation about the Garden of Eden, but we're going to stop. So I can share a couple more things. But let me tell you, God is so downpouring revelation in this time because he wants you to have details on the plan and the vision he's given you for your life. And by the way, I agree. If you get a word from God, don't fold it up and stick it in your Bible. You better be taking that out every day and declaring what God said about you. And then asking him how you can start walking that out. Because I too, even though I literally had a divine Jesus in person encounter where he told me what I would be doing, I still had to do something about it. You know, it didn't just automatically happen for me. You're going to write books about heaven. We're going to take you all over the world. You're going to share revelation. Uh, our people will be excited about it. The world will fall in love with you because you'll bring hope and truth that they haven't gotten before. And he said, but before we do that, we're going to let you meet our friends. So hello, friends of God. If you're here, you're a friend of God or somebody trapped you into coming. Good luck. If you've never heard me speak before, mercy upon you and grace. It's truth. God is far beyond our natural mind and understanding Amen. of who he is. And yet all the glory, the splendor, the wonder, the power, the majesty, the love, the love, and the love that I really love everybody. I do. I love all of you. You're my family. We are a family. In heaven, there's no areas that say, here's the Baptist section, the Catholic section. Yes, I've seen Catholics in heaven. <laughs> if you believe in Jesus Christ and have received him as your Savior, you'll be there. Some people, he didn't have a chance to tweak them. He took them while he had them. I'm serious as another whole message. But in all of this that I share, he is your father. Amen. He is your original father. No matter how your father was on the earth, he sent you here. He loves you. He made you. He wants you empowered. He wants you to know details about him, details about heaven, details about what he's going to do on this earth. And that's why we're having this conference. You need to take it seriously. You're in a whole new time on this earth with the abilities and the revelation that other, other generations of believers haven't, had, haven't been given before. He wants you to have revelation. You ask him for it. 
because this is called the kingdom age in heaven. Amen. We're in a whole new time that never existed on this earth, a whole new spiritual atmosphere with the possibilities of the signs and wonders and manifesting as a manifested son or daughter of God to stun this world, shock hell, cripple the kingdom of darkness for generations to come learning how to rule and reign with christ operate in the spirit realm which jesus did all the time when that time when they were coming after him and and it said that he was hidden and he walked through them he walked through their bodies he stepped into a realm that nobody could see, but he knew where it was. He stepped in it and walked through that spiritual uh, part, whatever it was, a rift or whatever that was that he stepped into. When he did, he disappeared from natural eyes and walked through the people. That's why spiritual beings can pass through these physical walls. If you step in the spirit realm, the physical cannot touch you in any way whatsoever. They, they can't touch you, harm you, stop you, hinder you. There will be many people who God will take into the spirit realm, into a prison in a foreign country right before a firing squad in a, in a foreign country, and you will grab the hand of that person, pull them in there with you, and disappear, and then they won't be killed. And there are people he's actually designated as rescuers, and that will be their primary job in the earth. These are different times. The spirit realm is an, an amazing place where many things go on. Both sides are there. So you definitely better know, uh, chart your course ahead of time and prepare yourself to operate in the spirit. And don't ever go there without Holy Spirit. People have been doing that for ages on this earth, on the other side, on the side of darkness. And, you know, a lot of people who live that way know, know that it's a real place. Yeah. And they travel there for the, for the enemy. But if God takes you through there, they will flee from you. They won't want to be anywhere near you. But everything in the spirit is orchestrated by Holy Spirit. Yeah. You're not the Lone Ranger doing it on your own. So you better know him. Yeah. Amen. You choose to step into things. Today, when we said yes, you chose to step into something. There's always an action that you have to take, uh, a physical action, when you've chosen to do something for God, no matter how fantastic or impossible it sounds. You won't do anything with it if you don't choose yes. And I have one more revelation to give you. When God said, many are called but few are chosen. Do you know why he said that? Because only the few say yes. He can't choose someone who's not, not interested or doesn't want to do it. So you all said yes. <laughs> you already said yes. You wouldn't be here. And I will tell you this, that before he sent you here, he already shared all this with you. Back, way back when. No humans lived on this earth. We all lived in God. And he used to hold you in his hand and tell you things about times to come. And you said yes. And right now, we had friends. And right now, what he's doing is bringing many people who are friends in him. He's bringing us and connecting us together in this earth to do a great thing for him in this earth. He planned and timed your birth on planet earth. It was not a mistake. It's not a mistake that you hear now. He plans people's birth and times it on the earth. And if you're in this meeting, somebody somewhere in your generational line laid their life down for the kingdom. Because this is all kingdom stuff that we're doing right now. And you may not have known somebody 500 years ago did it. You may say, I don't have anyone in my line. You have somebody somewhere because you've been carrying seeds of greatness that were planted way back when, generations ago. And that seed of greatness is passed down through the ages until it's time to fulfill that vision he gave to a generational line. And then those people who are alive in the time when he plans to do his vision, which is our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done. That's always been God's vision. 
That's God's dream. His will being done on this earth just like it is in heaven. That's a dream. That's a vision he has, and it's starting to come to pass in this time. So you are here. You are here. This is the only way I prophesy. I don't do personal prophecy anymore because God wants the body of Christ to move together, act together, understand that this is a time when he's using the body, and we're all a part of that team, okay? So you are here. Because if somebody way back when was willing to lay down their life and then they pass it on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, that's how destiny takes place. And we're all apart. It talks about it. In Hebrews 11, talks about it. Great people of faith who did things but didn't see, remember the fruition, but we all join it together in the reward. He uses generational lines. You are here representing your generations from the past. Look up to heaven. Everybody look up there. Say, thank you for choosing me. <laughs> now they were all screaming and yelling in heaven. Because when he sends me somewhere to speak, all of your family and friends living there are watching this meeting. Heaven gets live streaming all the time. They don't even need a device to get it. <laughs> it shows automatically up there. And your, your family and friends know that it's happening now. They're up there screaming, say yes! <laughs> so you're going to get to fulfill uh, a plan that God had in a generational line in this time on the earth. And that's why he sent you. He told me that a long time ago. You're here not just because you look good in pink hair. <laughs> or you'll talk to anything, whether it's living or not. You're not here for that. You're here because your, your generous line paid a price for the kingdom. And I know, I knew that. I knew for back into the 1700s we've traced, we've always had people that stood for holiness, that love God, that love people, that wanted God's will done his way. Say, his will. His will. His way, His way. today, because today. a lot of people want the will of God, but they want to do it their way. Yeah. Uh, that's not His will. His will means His way, and there's a big difference. And so that's why it's important to know the direction He has you going in, but you do have to do something about it. And everybody is here for a divine purpose, and all those watching, you're here for a divine purpose. And so this is a serious time, but it is a fun time. Uh, before I left, every word I got was about it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be hilarious. You know, it's hilarious when you learn how to defeat the enemy in your life and then make him run. It's hilarious when you connect with heaven and he actually lets you know you're here. You have important things to do, but you can enjoy every single moment of it. Whether it's in the waiting time, the hard times, uh, whatever. You know, I mean, I've slept on people's floors and I woke up laughing. We lost everything we had and I laughed. And then we sang and danced. You know, we were celebrating. Oh, my goodness, something awesome is going to happen. I cannot wait to see what God's going to do. How about doing that when you lose everything? I didn't blame the devil. I didn't complain to people either. I celebrated with my God. I knew he was going to do something new with me. I didn't know it would be taking tours of heaven all the time. I just knew whatever it was, I wanted it. So you can't automatically think, well, I know this is like you were saying, well, God said this, so this is how it's going to happen, and it will happen this way at this time. And if you stay in that box and he tries taking you in a different direction than you thought, then you'll think you missed it. As long as your heart stays pure and you're on fire for him saying, I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to do your will your way. Just start showing me your way and I'm going after it. Now how crazy it is. Doesn't matter. Amen. And when he came in my home and sat on my love seat at four something in the morning after taking me to heaven for years, he said, now, now you're going to write books. Well, I've never written a thing in my life. I'm going to give tips on being an author before we're done tonight. How many people God has told you to write books? Let me see. I know that because he said, I'm going to put uh, uh, pens in the hands of ready writers. They have something to share with the world. 
And so there are tips I can give you at, at the end of this, or it might be tomorrow night I give them, very practical tips on how to start that whole thing. And I would encourage you to get self-published. There's a difference, okay? Uh, there's a big difference, and we'll hear more about that probably tomorrow night. Anyway, um, that was sort of my introduction. Okay, was that good? <laughs> I'm going to just take a minute to talk about a few of my things because I never do, uh, and it's important. I forget I have so many products out there, and I have 80 new titles to record. haven't had time. New revelations and stuff, but I just haven't had time. So, yes, I, I am an author, and, yes, I had to have help from God to learn to set aside time. And now I know you go, well, what if I can't write during that time? You trust God. You say, okay, God, I'm setting, around, setting these two hours every night, or I'm setting four hours every other night. And I finally had to shut myself away in my own house where I was still a wife, still a mother, still a daughter. Uh, you know, a bunch of my family have always lived with us, and we had all kinds of, uh, you know, it was not quiet. And every time I sit there going, I, I have to write this book, and I've got all this stuff going on. You know what God would say to me? You're not in prison. How would you like that encouragement? <laughs> you are not Paul, and you're not in prison, and you're not half blind. I think you can do it. <laughs> and then I would sit there and just start writing. I would just start writing, and I had to do illustrations, and book three is not done yet. I have 25 illustrations of the spirit realm. A human soul is one of the ones that I'm, he's having me put in the UB set. You have to see what a human soul looks like. It's actually beautiful, how powerful it is, the way it operates, and you're the one in charge of it. You feed your soul, either darkness or light. You choose it. If you don't like what's coming out of here, check what's in your soul, okay? I know in the, in the years to come, people will come up to you and go, so what's in your layers? Because your soul has layers and it collects information, images, words, Sounds, music, whatever side you're listening, reading, or watching, it's in there, and it will affect how you think and what you choose. If you don't like it, loose it and get it out of there. We'll probably do that before I leave, or I, I might be in trouble. I don't want to be in trouble. So this is book two. Um, it's supposed to be blue. It's kind of blue. The first one was teal. This one's blue. The next one will be purple because I didn't pick those colors. God picked those colors, and on it is the wing of the living creature. I didn't pick anything about the book, and they have uh, eyes and every feather on their wings, and their arms and hands, which look like liquid hands. That's why the word says sort of like a hand or arm. Um, they're beautiful. They're powerful. They're huge. And so this is a book two with new revelations, uh, new encounters I had in heaven. And um, for those who don't know me, God would catch me up to heaven in my spirit. I've never been there in my physical body. I feel like I'm eight years old. I'm filled with life, excitement, joy, unending love, looking at splendor, trying to not watch the flowers sing, and people ride on their praise when they worship God. They ride on their praise across the sky. It catches them up, and you ride on your praise. And so you're seeing all these beautiful waves of the rainbow going out from God all over heaven, capturing people and bringing them to himself. You see all kinds of creatures step out of beautiful waterfalls, and their voices just, they're captivating, and it's just awesome. You see rocks jumping up and down, praising God. You see aromas in heaven, you smell them and see them and want to eat them, <laughs> and it leads you to where the food is that you're smelling. How about that? You see worship. You see it. It's just an amazing place. It's, it's our home. It's where we came from. It's where your family members are living. Your clothing makes music and changes color for all those who can't decide what to wear. You put your rainbow outfit on. You have a wardrobe. Say, we get a wardrobe. Get a wardrobe. Say, God, God can, afford can afford more than two outfits. And there's many events in heaven that people love to wear different things. You, part of you just doesn't really change. You've loved the same colors. You love the same foods. Food is everywhere in heaven. 
You worship God in fellowship and go to events. You get to create things in Creation Lab. You step through a door with the title of Observatory and you're out in space without a spacesuit. This is heaven. This is God's house. Don't you think it should be like that? Why is not boring? Why should it be boring? I think your own child would be bored if all you did was bow down to them continually, nonstop, all the time. Worship has a whole new uh, meaning when you get to heaven. Everything you do, when you enjoy the things he made for you, you're worshiping him. You're grateful for everything, and you never stop telling him. That's the world that your family members have moved to. And you're never away from him, ever. Jesus goes all over heaven. He'll show up at your mansion and just spend time with you. The disciples will. The apostles, the prophets. Enoch has emerald eyes. He has his own vibration. You hear him coming before he gets there. He was God's friend. Who wants to be his friend? He so loved God and so wanted to do things his way. And he visited heaven many times. God caught him up many times. And one time he just kept him. He didn't live very long on the earth because most people live to be like a thousand. He didn't stay on earth that long. He's sure been there a long time in heaven. <laughs> and God may keep you. There's silence in this room. When he told John, when he told the disciples, what is it to you if I let him remain until I return? There will be people on this earth that live very, very long times because we are that generation, that type and group of people that will taste of the powers of the age to come. And in the millennial age, people will live to be seven, 800 years old. It probably depends on what you're willing to do. John went because he chose to go. They couldn't kill him. And by the way, when they boiled him in oil, he probably was asking for a scrubber for his back. <laughs> because he didn't burn. He didn't have boils. He did people picture him all burned up in boils. Oh no, it never touched him, just like the Hebrew children. He was boiled literally in pots of oil, trying to kill him, and he probably was singing while he was in that pot. And they couldn't stand it and they were freaked out. So they put him on the aisle of Fatmos where he couldn't do any harm. <laughs> That's why they put him there. If we can't kill him, we're gonna put put him away from the people so he can't talk about his God. Maybe they'll turn out like him. But I do happen to know there'll be people that will live to be hundreds and hundreds of years old now who are on the earth right now, on this earth. It's going to happen. There are people who will learn to live on nothing but the life of God. And I eat once a day, and sometimes not even then. But I don't miss it. And people think, well, that's because you went to heaven all the time. No, I pursued him before I ever went to heaven. I didn't ask for this. This, this wasn't my choice to do this. It was his choice. My choice was to fall in love with him and pursue him, pursue all three of them. I wanted to know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus came to, to reveal us and bring, bring revelation on the Father, right? Is that correct? He's the only way to the Father. When your family members do die and they move to heaven, Jesus is the one who takes them up the steps of the throne and gives them back to the Father. So don't wonder, don't worry. Have they ever seen Jesus in heaven? He was one of the first people they met. Unless, of course, he picked them up in his own chariot, and sometimes he does that. You go home in chariots, things that look like spaceships, World War II biplanes. A lot of little young boys are caught up in a biplane and taken through the universe with their guardian angel. It's not boring. The moment you die in this life and your spiritual body steps out of this body as a believer, you're engulfed with God. You're engulfed in the life and the glory of God. You're seeing your guardian angels for the first time who may surprise you what they look like. Because if you're a funny person, they're probably wearing a red clown nose. 
I actually had an encounter where I saw that happen. I knew, I know what happens. Your guardian angel absolutely adores you. They do. They're for you. They're for you all the time. They're not against you. They're with you all the time, and you probably have more than one because one has to go home for a break. <laughs> they need R&R. &R. Ridiculous fun and relaxation. <laughs> anyway, this is my book. <laughs> This is very important. This is an awesome, uh, most of my DVDs I also have in CD. This is called Copycat. It's the true versus the false. It's every image, uh, manner, way, uh, uh, things that they do in heaven that's been copycatted and stolen by Satan and defiled on the earth. And you may be surprised what was not actually a pagan holiday or pagan celebration or ritual like a thousand years ago but something that actually existed in heaven that they did and satan knew it and he mocked that sign that symbol or whatever that thing was and he defiled it on the earth and want people to think it belongs to him and it's not his he can, he's only a copycat because he can't create and so I, would, I got so undone after delivering this message, they almost had to carry me off the platform because truth was given on so many uh, things that people go, oh, that's, a, that's a pagan ritual from way back when, or you know, this belongs to Satan. I went, no, because I happen to know that's always been in heaven. He's just mocking it. And I'll give you an example, okay, that uh, the mark of the beast, by the way, is not a microchip. It's not a barcode. It's going to be a visible sign that you can probably see three blocks down the street. Because Satan will want everyone to know these people chose me. If it's invisible, it's not a mark. Say marks, marks. are not invisible. And I happen to know the body of Christ, every little new thing that comes along, that's the mark of the beast. There's the Antichrist. There's nobody smart enough on this earth right now to be the Antichrist. I'm so sorry. <laughs> There's not one living human being on this earth that's smart enough to be the Antichrist. They will have solutions for the world. They will. There's no one smart enough right now because he's not here right now. No matter what you have figured out in your mind, he is not here. The four horses of the apocalypse are still in the barn. That's going to be the next thing down the pike now that the four blood moons have come and gone and we're still here. You need to run after what God wants. Don't waste your life trying to escape. You find out what he wants. You, you uh, chart your course and do it well. And whatever you can do to get started on that, you find out everything you need if you're going to build something for God, and by the way, that is part of the ministry, but it could be in business. It could be in entertainment because he is giving people courses in their life right now to go into every one of those fields and take them. Don't sit there and think you have to figure out what pastor, apostle, prophet, or teacher you're supposed to be. If he keeps telling you he wants you to be an actor, an actress, a screenwriter, scriptwriter, a fashion designer. Be the best chef in your area. He has given powerful, amazing gifts to people. And right now, the body of Christ is going to start pulling you into that arena. And if that's what your heart and your passion is and you're connected to God, then that's probably what he wants you to do. So you chart your course according to the passion he has put in you to do. And if it never leaves you and you're really close to him, that's probably what he wants. Because I know he says the body of Christ is always trying to find out what ministry am I going to be in. And yet the gift he gave you to release the world and draw people to him is your natural gift, your passion. Yeah. Whether it's an athlete, I have a whole thing that they're called gifted. It's all about your natural gift and how you use them in heaven. You're going to use your gift in heaven. If you bake amazing brownies here that people come for miles to get, you'll be baking brownies in heaven. And they'll come for miles to get your brownies. What do you think you're going to do up there? Your whole mansion and your property is designed around the gift he put inside of you. 
That's why there's so many things to do up there because every time someone else comes home, there's something else that's being built that people can partake of for free. Yeah. Say, I receive it. I receive it. So when you, if you say you don't know what you're supposed to do, <laughs> go look in the mirror and ask yourself, if I could do something and make a living doing it, that I would do that, then that's probably what you're supposed to do. Because I know somebody who was meant to be a comedian, they became a pastor, and they are the worst pastor I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> they have like six church members. That should be a sign and a symbol. That's not their gift. And I went there, and they said, if I'm still here 30 years from now, somebody kill me because I don't want to live here in this time. But that's not a pastor. Then the next thing was some funny jokes he heard, and you're sitting there laughing to yourself. But it had nothing to do with God. I went, you have missed your calling. You're a comedian. You are not a pastor. Do us all a favor and go be the comedian. The associate pastor is probably supposed to be the pastor. Amen? And I know this is part of charging your courses. This is what he wants me to talk about right now. You have to know who you are and what he made you to be because you weren't ever going to get rid of that gift you are. Every good and perfect gift, good and perfect, good and perfect gift, that's you, came down from the Father of lights. Your gifts are irrevocable. He's not going to take them away. They're without repentance. You can't say you don't know what it is because the thing you love the most is the thing you talk about, think about, tell people about. You either watch or go to, go to see it or do it whenever you can. It's probably your hobby. It's most likely not your job. You don't have jobs in heaven. You use your gift in heaven to bless everybody. You train up a child in the bent, in the way, in the gift I made them to be, their very passion, and they will never depart from that gift. That's what that scripture means. Because he needs that gift on this earth. Yeah. It's special. It's something you do really well that you absolutely love doing. So when you go to chart your course, make sure you're charting the right course. Yeah. And he can still use that gift in supernatural ways. And it can bring you before people that are trying to, trying to be a, a spiritual entity or in the ministry, it may not open those doors for you. But if you're meant to be the best golfer ever, and you do it well, the world doesn't care what you believe, but they'll listen to you all day long. That's why celebrities, that's why people, and the, all these great chefs, they could get a crowd around them and talk to them all day long. They just want to be near them and hear them. And if, and if you're well, doing your gift well, whatever it is, you're going to draw people to the light that's in you God gave you that gift, and he's not going to take it away. And your entire mansion and property, whether it's a whole comedy club or an amazing restaurant or a whole dance studio with a performance center as part of your mansion so people in heaven can come and learn things from you and come and watch you perform and do things, you get command performances in the throne room all the time. Amen. Maybe it's to run a rodeo. Were you expecting this? <laughs> Your daddy wants you to use that gift. Because they're powerful on earth, but you're, they're amazing in heaven, and you don't pay for anything in heaven. Amen? All the lawyers play golf. <laughs> That's about what they're good for. I know I worked for law firms for years, and almost every one of them played golf. You know why? It was their passion. Law wasn't their passion. They made good money sometimes, but they were very well hated by a lot of people. <laughs> but in heaven, we don't need lawyers or bankers or doctors or morticians. However, I do know what the funeral home people do in heaven. Who wants to know? They operate the Welcome Home Center in heaven. <laughs> For all the people who are having heaven culture shock, when they step out of the transport and see people laughing and singing and dancing in the streets of gold, and they can't believe this is really heaven because they thought it would be boring and very quiet, 
and they stand there, and I've seen them in utter shock. And then here comes the Hartage family. And they'll put their arm around them. It's really gonna be okay. Yes, this is heaven. And it's more wonderful than you ever dreamed. Come on in here, and we will help you to understand. And then when you come out, it's going to be all okay. We promise you. And so those who used to sit, <laughs> those, those who saw you last when they sent you to heaven now greet you when you get to heaven. Because their gift was kindness and compassion on the earth to comfort people when somebody died and so now they're in heaven comforting those when they arrive because it's a shock to them how wonderful, awesome, adventurous, exciting, and fun it is. So God's going to use your gift. Funeral homes here, welcome center in heaven. So make sure you identify your gift so you can chart the right course. Amen. I forgot, I have some more stuff to talk about. This one is called um, The Ancient Paths, and everybody thinks they've identified the ancient paths. You know, it was somewhere in, over in the east. It was somewhere in Israel. It was, you know, it was inside God. The, more, the most ancient paths you can find are inside God. Eternity came from him. He did not appear somewhere in eternity. He holds, he holds everything by his word. He created everything by his word. When there was nothing, there was him. Well, there was Melchizedek, and there was the living creatures, and there was a few others that were with him and have always been with him, but most everything else he made. So this shows where you came from before you were here, what you looked like, what your existence was like. It shows what the heart of God is how he operates, how he creates the rainbow from his person. It's, it's powerful what Lucifer looked like before he fell, how he fell, how that war took place in heaven, um, how old the earth is, how the earth split into parts. There's a whole lot on here, uh, and it's powerful. And then there's one here, this one of my favorites called The Kingdom Age. It's a double CD. It talks about when we stepped off the threshold of time into the kingdom age. I was standing in the middle of America, 8 a.m. in the morning, my sleeping time. I look like warmed over hash. I have a picture. One day I might release it. Because <laughs> I sleep from 6 to like 10, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. I don't go on man's time. So if I do morning meetings, I don't look so hot. Most of the videos, unfortunately, you see me in, including this one probably. I look like warmed over hash. Now, in this one, I look really good. I'd like to use this picture everywhere if I possibly could because I was fresh. I was alive. I was doing a youth conference. Um, and another one I have, too, and I look really good. But the next morning, I look not good. I look good at night, and in the morning, I've wiped out from 3,000 youth sucking the life out of me, <laughs> releasing the lightning power of God, which is another one of your weapons you have available. So this is really powerful. It tells you exactly what time you're living in and what time it isn't. And it's very powerful. And this one is my newest one. Um, this one is called Now. I love the word now. I hear all over heaven, they're shouting now down to the earth. Because you're not waiting for something to happen anymore. We're in a time when things are happening now. This is the time now for you to do things for God. This is the time now to make sure you know what you're doing and how to do it. So this is called Now. Scrolls of time have been opened. And this is powerful. And this is another one that's just as powerful that every believer needs to know about. It's called Invite Heaven's Army. And on it is the face of one of the hosts of heaven. It is a real angelic being. He's not part of Gabriel's group. Gabriel's group look like you and I, except they're powerful. Uh, Michael's group do not look like us. Not in any way. They look like creatures. Everybody say creatures. creatures. They exist in heaven. They're the good guys. <laughs> well, there's a whole tribe. Angels are made in tribes. In case you wondered, that's why we have tribes on the earth, tribes of Israel. They weren't the first ones. Angels are made and created in tribes. And that one tribe of angels, they all look very similar to each other. They have one defined purpose. This is the commander of the royal guard, and they all look like lions. 
If you've seen lions appear in the clouds in the sky, the Royal Guard, millions of them have been released down to the earth right now to war on your behalf. And, and this one appeared with me, in, to me, in front of my husband, my Scottish husband, who has five layers to his soul and has very little expression unless he's fishing. <laughs> fishing is his gift. He will fish in heaven. He'll be Peter's new best friend. <laughs> I've seen Peter. I've seen the back of him. He's fishing. But this is a real being, and I couldn't, uh, couldn't think of what to put on here, invite Heaven's Army. I was going to say invite the host, but many people don't know who in the world the host are. The host, the host, are the armies of heaven. And when it said a great host appeared in the sky at the birth of Jesus, they weren't choir boys from Gabriel. They were the army with Michael, because the choir boys got kicked out, most of them, with Satan. He was over all the worship angels. They went with him. They were the ones that were deceived. They were out. The seraphim weren't deceived. You know, the seraphim are the burning ones whose hair looks like blue fire that are in the glory cloud over the throne. You learn a lot when you go to heaven a lot. One thing I learned was some of those weird-looking things in the sky are not demonic. The host of heaven are not pretty. They were made to be fierce. So there's a difference in being, you know, demonic is an ugliness that's filled with darkness. Fierce is what the host of heaven look like. So if you think they look scary, they're supposed to because they're supposed to scare the darkness. Would you want somebody with a pretty harp fighting for you or someone who had 18 eyes and lightning coming out of every pore of their being? Who would you want to fight for you? <laughs> so this is called Invite Heaven's Army. It's like six bucks. It'll change your entire life. The way you begin to rule and reign with Christ and you will not be attacked. I've not been attacked in a year and I can boldly say that because the army is with me everywhere I go and they're with me because I employ them. It's called Invite Heaven's Army. I have a brand new uh, two CDs. Uh, one I have, uh, it's got more detail on it called Hosting the Host. Uh, God said, name this Invite Heaven's Army so people will know what you're talking about. But in the next one, you call them the host. That's what their name is. And by the way, they don't like to be called angels. They're called the host in the Bible. Okay? Because they're different from the other angels. They're all powerful. They all have high uh, skills that God created their image. But Gabriel's group are messengers, couriers, scribes, the worker angels. They work with the body parts in the body parts warehouse. The scribes record things you say and take them back to heaven. Or they bring messages down to you now. Messengers bring all kinds of things from God to the earth. They've always interacted with God's people. They always have. There's a big difference in the angels that belong to Satan. Let me tell you, uh, the host of heaven would never allow you to worship them. Neither would Gabriel's group. They won't, they won't permit it. They won't allow it, okay? And yet they're sent here on our behalf. Y'all aren't saying nothing. I used to think you were mad at me, but I understand you're just in shock or, <laughs> or captivated. Is that correct? Yeah. Heaven should be captivating. And he uses me because I was raised with a tribe of kids, and you said your peace whether they wanted to hear you or not. And you learned to stay in line, and you learned perseverance and long suffering because we had one bathroom. And your, your place couldn't be bought or bartered for or threatened. You didn't lose your space in that line. So we learned all kinds of things being raised together. They sharp, we sharpened each other. We put up with each other. We learned to love each other. We were all very different. And uh, so God had a reason to put me in that tribe of people. So if I can love them, I can love you, okay? But, but God does things differently than we do. That's why his ways are strange and his thoughts are strange, but they're wonderful. And when you begin to have his thoughts and his ways, you totally understand everything he's doing. You get excited about having to do strange things like have pink hair. And this is coming to the body of Christ. You're going to see it more and more in the body, even more so than in the world. That's going to shock the world, isn't it? This is what God said. I'm going to take what's inside of you and put it on the outside. 
If you have an evangelistic team, I encourage you to get some kind of highlight in their hair, especially if they're over the age of 50. Because you can walk up, you're a living Bible track. And when they say, oh, I love your hair, they are going to get Father, Son, Holy Spirit, heaven, culture, the future God has planned for them, who they really are, where they came from before they were born, how the earth was split in half. It's millions of years old, no matter what you think, what the future looks like for everybody, how to operate in the spirit realm. And let me tell you what, they don't run away. I have never had one sinner run away from me. I start... I start meetings at the checkout line in the grocery store, <laughs> at the gas pump, in restaurants, on the airplane. Just give me the mic, and we'll have a real meeting, okay? Because I would totally do it. <laughs> Make them laugh, cry, and get saved all at the same time. You take off your sinner, your land, you belong to God, ready for the kingdom age. <laughs> I may be going to Norway. If I do, I'm going to talk my way around and take something to bribe them to give me the microphone. <laughs> we have a long flight. I can keep everybody happy and captivated. And, but we may have revival service and fire might start up, but it won't burn the plane up. <laughs> you need to expect the unexpected. I need to take a drink of water somewhere. Mm. I'll give this to my sister. I don't like taking time to take the cap off. <laughs> I'm wasting time. I don't want to waste time. Are y'all okay? Yeah. Somehow this is all going to... I feel like Jesse Duplantis tonight, because you know he always gives this is what my message is, and he never talks about that. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? And at the very end, he kind of winds it up with his last statement, and that's what I meant by this. And I had nothing to do with that. But did you love his message? By the way, I noticed some of that on YouTube. <laughs> because if you speak for God, he will say what he wants to. If you let him, it's going to be so much better than what we do. And it is important to have a plan, okay? He might let you use your plan A. But if he is plan A, then scrap plan A and go with his. Because it's going to be what every one of us need. Is that true? Just trust him. He told me tonight, you're not going to have notes. Okay, well, I lose them or drop them on the floor usually. Anyway, uh, if you see my videos, I drop things, almost knock the water off. My scarves I used to wear used to fall off of me. They'd be hanging down to the floor, and I didn't care because I, I want to share. That's what I'm here. I'm here to share. If they're there, you will share. So try not to have a meeting with me at the products table or in the ladies' bathroom, <laughs> trying to get in the car. Because I have meetings, and they used to not send anybody with me, and I'd be in the ladies' room, and the meeting started at 45 minutes, and I'm still in there having a meeting. Because <laughs> I don't know what time it is. Uh, there's no time in heaven. So I'm just sharing and sharing and sharing. They come looking for me. What are you doing in here? We, okay. Uh, this was in Canada. They went, you, you can't go in the bathroom anymore by yourself. <laughs> we are going to have people escort you there and then bring you out as soon as you're done. And I would tell people this when I would, was recently in Richmond, Virginia, and they said, yeah, okay. And they went in there with me, and as we, each woman came out of the stall, ah, it's you! <laughs> After about the third one, they said, you're going to wait down the hall. You're going to go in the pastor's office. You're going to go there. We, we can't have meetings in the bathroom going, so then I come out, walk through the children's ministry. And all the little children run up to me, can I have a dinosaur in heaven? Can I fly on a pterodactyl? Uh, does he make houses out of chocolate? Are there whipped cream swimming pools? <laughs> and I look at the people like, please let me answer their questions. <laughs> Kids are my favorite thing because you know what? They can still believe the unbelievable. <laughs> and I want you to know that there's five-year-olds that watch me on YouTube. And there's eight-year-olds that email me about what I say on, on YouTube. Tell me how to pray for my family. Because they're in drugs, and they're in crime, and I have snuck out to the computer just to email you and get a plan. Because I want to release the anointing, and I want to know how to send the host to pull down these strongholds that are keeping my family in bondage because I love them, but I don't want to live in this darkness and I'm not tolerating it. And these are eight-year-olds. 
I said, number one, don't sneak out in the middle of the night. <laughs> At least do it early in the morning, but not in the middle of the night. You're emailing some lady with pink hair. <laughs> and your parents find out you may not be able to watch me anymore. But I will answer them and give them a plan. Because you know what? God, God wants to use the unusual today. And even children, they have no problem believing these amazing things that God says. You know, it's still been, a, I love looking at babies, by the way. Babies, yes, they see angels. All babies see angels. And the reason they're laughing is because they're being tickled by the angel. Their guardian angels tickle them all the time. If you hear them laughing or giggling, it's because they're being tickled and they can actually see the angels tickling them. Uh, dogs can see angels and the demonic. They can see both. They have that sense in them that they can see. And they know it's not good. Amen? Say, God, open our eyes, open our eyes. To, see. to see and hear and, hear. and, know. and know what you have for me. Have for me. I receive it. Now, I'm going to have to use uh, some of the, my meetings started. I'm going to stop and just a minute to take up the offering because the Holy Spirit just reminded me that I was supposed to do that. And so, uh, but I, I have to use, if I can find them. I'm not good with technical things. Ask my staff. I had an old phone that the window was this big on it. But you know what? I still have everybody's contact information, and I plug it in the wall, and it's my electronic address book. Because the other ones I've had have blown up, burn out, or just died from all the stuff that's on there. You know, it's not easy to carry, like, 100,000 stuff on there from, from Facebook or, or 11,000 emails. They weren't meant to carry all that stuff when you just got a little gig phone, whatever that thing is. I don't know what a gig is. <laughs> I thought that was what a band did on the weekend. <laughs> So to me, if you call me as the geek squad and say what kind of computer you have, I'm going to tell you it's gray. Because <laughs> that's all I know. I do not understand technical things. But I can tell you how the world began. <laughs> My husband, if you know or have seen anything, he is a, a captain. And he loves to fish, and he loves to go. Um, he can... Use any boat. I don't care if it's 50 foot, 100 foot. That man gets on there. He is fearless on the water because he's using his gift. And he used to uh, sell boats one day. He'll have a marina, man a marina, fishing for the king with Bing. will be on the side of all his fishing boats. <laughs> and so he said, I'll give you some points because he knew what the, the title was. And so he... He said, you need to know something about navigation. Navigation is the science of finding your position on Earth's surface in order to get from where you are to where you want to go. From point A to point B, charting your course, you need three basic items. Um, you need your bearing. Uh, that's where you are, the direction you are going. And, and he made a joke and said, that doesn't always mean straight ahead, because one time I got lost. That's one of the times I got lost. I was driving to a meeting just 45 minutes from my own home. It's a little tiny dinky town. They have like, they're supposed to have three exits, but they actually only have two. And I can tell you, because I could never find the one I was supposed to get off on. <laughs> and I kept calling my husband, and he was, he was so, supposed to go with me, but my Spanish interpreter was driving, and, uh, and she wasn't very good either. And so for 45 minutes, we were trying to find this one exit. And finally, I said, get back on the expressway, and we'll drive till we find the exit not thinking that we would go miles down the road past the city we were trying to find the exit in, but we were looking for exit number two. And uh, he finally called and he said, well, where are you now? You surely are at your meeting. And went, no, I'm, at my, I'm not at my meeting. I'm, I'm what we're still driving. He goes, well, what direction are you going in? I said, I'm going straight ahead. What direction do you think I'm going in? <laughs> I am not going backwards. And I hear my husband yell on the other end of the line. <laughs> She's lost. Oh, the car's going forward. It's going straight ahead. That's the direction I am taking. He said, the next time you see a sign, tell me what the sign says. 
Now, I was going from Jacksonville to St. Mary's, Georgia, which is just 40 minutes down the road. And this is like an hour and a half later. He, and I said, oh, I saw a sign. I, I found a sign, and it says something. And he goes, what is this? It says, the Golden Isles of Georgia, the Golden Isles. He goes, turn around and go back in the direction you're going in. And when you get to St. Mary's, get off on any exit and tell me the street you're on, I'll tell you how to get there. I want you to know, everybody who came to the meeting, I was going to speak at a meeting. Everybody left the meeting, they went and ate dinner, and then they came back to the meeting, and we had the meeting two hours late, but it was awesome. <laughs> so that's a joke when he said not straight. The second thing you need to know, uh, so the bearing is the direction you're going to go into. Number two is the position where you are right now. And these can all be very spiritual terms, okay? How far and how high do you want to go with God? You know, how great do you want to be in the earth? What level of authority do you want to operate into? Those are all directions that you should be shooting for, you should be going for. Your bearing is what is your life like right now? Where are you now? Are you spending time with him? Are you loving people? Are you watching every word that comes out of your mouth? Are you speaking life? Are you speaking death? Are you praying? You got to pray. You know, so what is your position you're in right now? What level of authority are you operating in? Do you know that you're under the weather? Not, you're not under the weather, you're over the weather? When I got out of the hotel, you couldn't see. And I looked at the weather and said, I'm over you, not under you, and you're going to stop. And I sent the host of heaven to tear up that system and make an opening in it so we're not going to be drenched in rain. You're done raining, and I'm done with you raining. Amen. And it stopped. So what, what, where are you right now? Where's your position? Are you, are, you, are you telling people about every storm, tornado, earthquake that's happened around the earth, or are you taking authority over them? Are you going to make the earthquake stop and put it back the way it was before it came? That's a, that's a supernatural sign that the body of Christ will be operating in. So if you're not already taking authority over the weather, don't expect to stop an earthquake. When destruction has come, buildings have fallen, people have died, and then you tell it to stop and you tell it to put it back. Because I was shown that will happen. And all the dead was raised, the buildings came back together, the land back it went exactly the way it was, and it went viral on the Internet. Are you praying for people to be healed? Are you believing for wholeness? Yes, we want to be healed, but how about declaring wholeness over their body? If I pray for people, I don't, pray, I don't say be healed, I say be whole. Be whole and live whole. If your soul prospers, you will, you will what? You will prosper and what? Be in health is a state of existence. That's not being sick and healed all the time. That's living whole all the time. So if you're not even praying for the sick or believing for them to be whole, um, how are you going to raise someone from the dead that was cremated at their funeral? I, I was shown that happening. It will happen. There are believers operating in that because their faith is expanded. They spent time praying for people to be healed, believing for the healing, actually going to places and laying hands on them, believing for wholeness, going further in God than where their current position was. They were shooting for something higher. And then God told them to go to a funeral where somebody had been cremated. They took the lid off the jar and commanded their spirit to come back in that body. The body was in the jar in pieces. And the Spirit of God hit that. A whirlwind of the ashes came out when it stopped. The person was there. Jesus raised the dead when they had been dead for four days. We will raise the dead that was cremated. Say greater works. Say shoot for that direction. So what position are you in now? Are you positioning yourself to do greater works, right? And then the third thing you need to know is distance how far you are going to go. And say, my distance, my distance in, God in God should be unlimited. We should not limit his power in us and the ability to manifest for him in this time. There's no way he's coming to rescue us if Romans 8 has not even happened. Or Joel 2 has not happened. 
It hasn't. There's scriptures, there's prophecies that have not come to pass yet. He saved them for this time. And sometimes people were created or born, and maybe they have dealt with something in their life, but they were made to be here for such a time as this, so a miraculous manifestation of God's healing power could take place and change lives. And maybe you were born to be the one who laid hands on that person and declared it. In the marketplace, in the business place, in the school arena, in the government arena, in the, in the entertainment industry, uh, you can be in ministry yourself, whether you are a licensed minister, but if God called you to be a minister, a pastor, a prophet, a teacher, an evangelist, then it doesn't hurt to get credentials. Amen? Because some people, they want evidence. They want natural evidence. They live in this natural world. They want something that says, yes, you're not some nut or fruitcake. That you're connected. And this is a time when God is connecting the body of Christ to each other. And sometimes uh, he connected. We have four new staff members who had their own vision and purpose and plan for God. They didn't realize it was going to be with us. And they fought God about it. Can you imagine? And he said, no, I'm sending you to a people whose vision is exactly the same, and you're going to each help each other to complete it. Because that wasn't what they had planned or what they thought was God's will. But it was clearly his will. I knew it. You know, I knew that. So be ready. Sometimes you may work together with others. You may be a part of somebody of what they're already doing, and you're called to come alongside them. You are just as important as the person who's up here speaking. I could not do what I do without my team. And that's why my new website doesn't just show me. It shows my team. We're the God Squad. God nicknames everything. Get ready for your little name that he's got that only you and he know. It will not be some long Bartholomew or whatever. You know, Ephesians, Leviticus, whatever, whatever. That's not going to be your nickname he has for you. It's going to be some cute name, some little powerful name, probably one word that you didn't expect him to call you. Zap, bam. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that name being named by God. He's going to have a nickname for you. He names every place in heaven. Every place I've been taken to, Valley of the Falls, Passionate Paradise, Techno City, Cartoon Village, Video Town, um, uh, I can go on and on. Jello Land. <laughs> My mama, who's 84, said, You are not telling people about Jello Land. <laughs> and went, No, I'm not telling them. God's telling them. <laughs> if it bothers you there's Jello Land in heaven, then do you still want to go? Because <laughs> I know a whole lot of kids that want to go to Jello Land in heaven. <laughs> And I am more and more delighted and surprised when I see movies, decent movies. I go to the movies, but I check them out first. I don't want to take any extra things home with me. Seriously, remember the soul thing? What you put in there is what you will think about and what you will choose. And then you will demonstrate with your layers and your emotions what you have been filling yourself with. And I have another clue to give you that God has recently shown me. I do not like violence except violence against the enemy. That I enjoy. I delight in violence against the enemy. I delight to destroy his plans, his purposes, crush his platforms he's been ruling on, push back darkness. I love it almost more than anything else except worshiping God. Because that's what heaven wants us to do. But when you run in and watch Satan's stuff, okay, you're not hurting just yourself. You're hurting everybody around you because then you're carrying home darkness. And you don't want to do that. And I was in a movie theater one time, and my eyes are open almost all the time, and there's spiritual ledges over every door, and depending on what was showing in there, demons would sit on them. And it didn't matter who went in that door. Young, old, pastor, teacher, prophet, evangelist, Musician, it didn't matter who you were, cookie baker, world whatever maker. It didn't matter who went in that door, they vomited on you. You think Satan doesn't mark you? He didn't have enough demons to go around every person in this world. They have to have a system. God marks you. 
He marks you with the glory. He, he takes that light on the inside of you and makes it explode till it comes on the outside of you. You get more brilliant. You get bright. You look like a burning inferno till the devil can't even see you. God increases what is in you that he has put in there when you give yourself to him and you follow his course. Amen? Amen. He marks you. He marks you in heaven. He actually puts a tattoo on your forehead and in the palm of your hand in heaven. Marking belongs to God. The enemy took it. He defiled it. He wants to put his marks on everybody. And one day we'll actually do that for people who receive him when he, you know, inhabits the Antichrist. We lived in God. He was our world. We were one people. You had little, like, gingerbread bodies. That's what you look like, little beings of light. Those lights, every perfect gift, perfect and good gift comes from the Father of lights. Your spiritual being is made out of light. You rode in and out on the rays of glory, in and out of God. You played in the river of life and on the stones of fire inside of him. Your only existence was in him. And at the time of conception, he takes, the Holy Spirit takes one of those little beings down into a woman's womb and attaches it, that dot of flesh. That is when life begins. That is when your guardian angels are sent. They're waiting for you to be born. And so that's where you came from. You came from him. He says, you are my offspring. He carried us. That's why he put water in the womb of a woman. Because you played in the river of life in him. And when he sent you, he put you in a familiar place. That mother sustained you and gave you sustenance while you were in her. He took care of us. He's called the mini-breasted money. He took care of us when we were with him and in him. He sent all of us to this earth. There wasn't one person on this earth that wasn't sent by him. Every person sent had a destiny. He loves every person he ever sent. He gave you a will inside of you. Your soul is in your will. Your will is very powerful. You choose with it. You make decisions with it. And in this time when you are setting your course, not just for this year, but for the rest of your life, choose him. Choose life. Choose to be powerful. Choose to be free from darkness. You can choose it. No matter what you've experienced or taken in your soul, you can lose it anytime you want to. It's real simple. You choose your will. Everybody stand up for a minute. And then I'm going to take a few more minutes to finish because I know I got tomorrow night. I want to tell you everything tonight. <laughs> We're going to lose everything from our soul. We don't want there. I have another revelation out there. It's called the temple. And people say, how long are you in heaven? I don't know. There's no time up there. But if for any reason I happen to glance at my clock and then he takes me, I don't know when he's going to take me. He just does it. He's catching up people all over this world and showing them heaven because he wants us to know what's there. And a lot of people have seen places I haven't seen. doesn't mean they haven't gone there. However, the enemy mocks everything God does. And in the spirit realm, both sides build places, spiritual places. And if you're taken there in the spirit, you better know who's taking you. Okay, you need to sit down for a minute. He said, make him sit back down. Up and down. See, this is not the Catholic or Episcopal church. <laughs> but it is the church. This is life-changing revelation that every believer on this earth needs to know about. And that's what he told me one morning when I woke up. And I, I always tell the Father how much I love him. I tell Jesus. I tell the Holy Spirit. I tell them good morning. I'm so grateful that they love me and that they trust me. And then I tell them I'm going to be just like them. And then I usually get a news bulletin from heaven. He either says something to me or takes me someplace or does something with me. My husband gets up, kisses me goodbye, and goes fishing. <laughs> There's like three or four-hour fishing. Bye. <laughs> which is okay with me and God both because he's out there talking to God while he fishes. Yep. That's how, when he communicates with God, it's when he's fishing. It's real quiet, but it's smelly. <laughs> Not in heaven, the fishing part. <laughs> I don't like it. And he picked him. He said, he's the one I chose from you before time began. He's it. You're marrying him. And when he doesn't know Moses. 
I don't care. He will know Moses. <laughs> He'll know me. You're going to marry him. You will produce holy seed. I need that holy seed. Through generations, you're going to marry that man. He's it. He likes to fish. <laughs> and it stinks. <laughs> I don't remember the thing that I don't like seafood or the smell of seafood. I'm not going to touch fish. Look at fish. I don't want to look at them or touch them. You're going to marry him. He's yours. <laughs> and I said, okay, because he's pretty good looking. He was a Marine, and even though he had a high and tight, that man looked good. <laughs> and I had watched the Seven Brides for Seven Brothers movie one too many times <laughs> when I was growing up. So about age 13, I went, God, I want a man just like that. I want me like a mountain man. I want someone who's strong, who could live off the land. I don't know why I said that, because I am not living off the land, sleeping on the land, digging in the land. <laughs> I don't want to walk on the land. He tripped me. But I want a man who could live in a puff tent and chop down trees and do things with his bare hands and pick me up and be strong and good looking. And that's exactly what he gave me. Because I didn't include him. He needs to know who Moses is. And he said, he has no religious baggage. He has, there's no religious baggage in him, OK? And he's a pretty good guy, and don't you think he's good looking? <laughs> yeah, I think he's pretty good looking. <laughs> and then uh, Holy Spirit, second name, which is Cupid, shot me full of love arrows. <laughs> and I went from saying, I don't want him, to saying, I can't live without him. And we will be married 39 years <laughs> this year, and I still am crazy about him. I don't want any other man. There is no other man for me. It is my husband. We both strange. We both love each other anyway. You know, uh, he doesn't want this microphone to tell you about things that he doesn't know about. But he will tell you all day long about fishing, about boating. He'll teach you all, all kinds. He'll teach your kids how to swim. And, uh, and he's a great leader. And he'll bark at you like a Marine and scare off the guys you don't want by your daughters. And he used to do that. And so anyway, he's, he's my man. That's what I ended up with, fishing, smells, and all. And I, I got a new car for Christmas. It's a lease. It's not a purchase. One day, God will give me a car. But right now, I've got one. And I said, please, don't anybody tell him that underneath that little back thing in the back, there's little compartments. Because he will say, that is a permanent lure box. <laughs> and in my new little uh, IKEA soul, I picked it because it had the name Soul learning a lot about the soul. And this is not what I was going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyway, OK? So he will put anything. He'll make live bait balls and used to stick them in the back of my, my other car I had uh, with live fish swimming in them. That's why it's called a live bait well, OK? And all his fishing equipment stuck through the seats somehow. He has a Jeep, a 1993 Jeep that I call the Baitmobile. If you would like to go for a ride in it, it has no AC. It has a black door. The rest of it is scratched up green. It smells like fish and bait. And I finally replaced the headliner because I didn't want to get rained on anymore by the stuff that comes out of there, whatever it was, because the poles had ripped holes in it. So all you who think I'm mishandling billions of God, you know, consider the fact that I could let you have the Jeep mobile for a really cheap price if you want to meet me somewhere. <laughs> the bait mobile. And so where was this all coming from? <laughs> you forgot to? <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so God does the soul. God does real funny things. And so I had to just get stuff out of my soul thinking, I don't want this man, I'm not going to marry this man. And finally, just let God have his way with me and fell in love with him. And at 39 years later, I, I wouldn't want any other way, okay? But your soul, and, and he wasn't perfect in the beginning, and I had to pray a lot of stuff out of my house and, and a lot of stuff, you know, away from me, but still loved him. I loved him long enough to find God, find out who he was. And now he's a man of the word. He'll read like nine translations at the same time. He will watch my videos 20 times in a row or anyone else's that he's seeking a revelation from. He's serious about getting God in him. And just watch it when he finally lets open that treasure. <laughs> I'll just step aside. 
But you don't have to keep anything in your soul if you have had a trauma in your life, if you were abused 40 years ago and still have tormenting dreams, if you were addicted to any kind of addiction. It's all about it getting in your soul. It's not just your flesh. Whatever you allow, whatever you give yourself to, there's a measure of that that's deposited in your soul. That's why he made you that way, so you can have deposits of him, of his life, of his glory, of his word, okay? He wants your soul to prosper, or he wouldn't have said that. When your soul prospers, you will prosper and be in health. Your soul needs to prosper in order for you to prosper and stay in health. A lot of the problem with the body of Christ is the things that they're giving themselves to, okay? Slandering, gossiping, you know, I'm going to go on into all that junk. Uh, if all you ever watch is doom and gloom on the internet, guess what you're filled with? Escapism. You're not ever going to know you can rule or reign. You will never be able to see this world change because you're so filled with fear that all the destruction and all the stuff going on in, in the earth, that's all you'll think about. And yet you were made to change it. You were made to be light, to operate in such a way that you push back darkness, right? Because if you put yourself under God and resist the devil, he will what? Flee. He will flee from you. He won't even want to be around you because you're so dangerous. But you have to put the right stuff in your soul, and you have to say the stuff. Every word you speak out of your own mouth is deposited in your own soul. So if you beat yourself up all the time, guess what? You're not ever going to want to chart a course because you can't ever even envision yourself doing something. Change what you're saying about you. God made you special. He made you powerful. If you belong to him, you are a living and new creature in him. You have a deposit of his spirit. You have a deposit of the anointing, according to 1 John 2, 27. Christ gave you power over all the power of the enemy. He gave us mighty, powerful weapons that can pull down strongholds that interfere in your life, that brings sickness, infirmities, that brings poverty into your life, that brings fear to you. You don't have to keep any of that stuff. If somebody bullied you or bashed you, you can turn around instantly and lose every one of those words from your soul, and it will be like it never happened. Because for four hours, earth time, God downloaded me into me that message called the temple and how he made your soul, how each part of us is made like one of them. Say, we are made in their image. Say, that's how, they look. that's how they look. And after their likeness, after their likeness that's, how they that's how they operate. And so he gave me so much revelation in there about how the Holy Spirit knows everything all at the same time everywhere. Uh, what your soul looks like, how it operates. He talked about your body. He talked about your spirit and how each of them give you a part of them when you get born again. It's a powerful message. But the most important part is this. You don't need months and months of deliverance. You don't need months and months of counseling. This is the kingdom age. This is an accelerated time, an accelerated time for everything, for wholeness, right, for creativity, for ruling, for handling the wealth, for building things for the kingdom. This is an accelerated time. You'll just have in your heart to give and do something, and your reward will come before you actually give it. That's what's coming to the body of Christ. And they were right, by the way. I guess I'm taking up the offering right now. <laughs> it is so important to seed into something that has changed your life. Because you can sit there and listen, and it's wonderful that you have that. But when you put something into it, when you make a deposit into it, you will get a harvest from all the stuff that you garnished from this conference. And I personally give into every conference I'm a part of. I want a part of all that I've learned from the others. Okay, I want to harvest in my life. And, and, and my position will change because of that. Even my bearings might change if I'm off course or something. Because you receive new revelation and you're hungry for that. And you said yes to that. He will make sure he corrects your course. So... It is so necessary to give and seed into things, and it will bring a harvest into your life. I have begun believing for a thousandfold return. It's mentioned in the Bible. In this kingdom age, many people are going to start getting a thousandfold return. I'm not promising you that, but I'm going to believe it for everybody who gives. And if you give into something that you know that you know this is God, that's where you give. 
You give where life is. You give where God has a plan for you, and not just you, but all of your family, all of your friends, for the body of Christ. If you know this is something he's doing, then that's the place to give because you know it's going to be really good ground. This is good ground to give. So if you want to get uh, envelopes ready or whatever, we're having the offering right now. And, uh, and you know what? In heaven, they get excited when you give. And, oh, by the way, I can tell you the battle cry for the host of heaven is woohoo! <laughs> when they're given an assignment to go tear down the works of the enemy or destroy a platform they've been ruling from, they will yell woohoo! <laughs> That's why I say it all the time. I'm not going to stop saying it. But it's very important to seed into something that you know is God. And I'm looking forward. Uh, I will be giving tomorrow, and I'm getting the biggest offering I can together of what I have to give because I believe in what Joan is doing. And you know what? Not everybody opens up their place to let other people come and share. Not everybody does that. You know, she has the faith to believe that God has people out there with gifts, with words that will help change the body of Christ, and, and she's going to be one of my new best friends. I intend to have a relationship with her. I intend to have a relationship with, with Matt, Mr. and Mrs. Sorger over there. You know, I want to know them more. I believe in what they're saying, and I could have probably given his message for him because I was very excited. If you didn't hear me yelling over there, that was me because I know what he was saying was truth because I've heard God say the same thing. Okay, he wants us to prosper. He wants to know who we are. He wants us to change what we're saying because it makes a huge difference in your life and to your kids' lives. You're speaking destiny into the generations coming after you. And I'm grateful that he gave me a father that did that. He gave me a grandmother that did that. Uh, we had a great-grandmother that did the same thing. Back down the generations of, of our life, my one uncle went and followed our history back several hundred years, found out we have Jew in us. I was informed by a Jew that if you have a little Jew, you're all Jew. <laughs> it overrides everything else in you. <laughs> you're just a Jew, so you just don't know it. And really, uh, my ancestors lived in windmills um, somewhere in the Netherlands, in Germany, or in between or somewhere. There's a big mix. And when Hitler's reign was over there, they hid Jews in their homes. And then they got married. And so that's where my heritage, my Jewish heritage comes from. Um, we also have horse thieves somewhere. And the, they escaped the news, though. Okay, they were caught. They were going to be hung, but they did get away. So that's good news. Amen? Amen? So the generations could keep going. We have presidents in our lineage and all kinds of things. And you start looking, you're never going to know what you're going to find. But the most important lineage you have is in heaven. Amen. We're all Havanians. Say, I'm a Havanian. <laughs> before I'm anything else. And so, Father, I pray right now over this offering, God, as your people prepare to give into something that you are doing that will change their lives and change this world. And, Father, I personally ask you as your child to bless each and every person. You know I'm serious about this. I want you to bless them every day of their life with your presence, with your love, uh, with a great future. I ask you to bless them with revelation and with direction, Father. I thank you for blessing them with good Christian friends. And I ask you to restore their family members, Father, that have been ripped from them by the enemy. I thank you, God, for a powerful restoration in all the lives of everybody sitting here. I thank you, God, for giving them hope hope in their lives, God, that this is your time on earth and you have a plan for each and every person. And Father, I ask you to give a thousandfold return to every person who gives into this offering, Father. And those watching, you can send an offering. <laughs> I know you can do that, and I don't know if you can do it on our website, but if you can, you need to do that too because you're receiving also and you need to seed into what is being done here. So Father, I thank you to bring a thousandfold return in finances in inheritance, in lands, in properties, even in family members, Father, even restoration of their health, restoration of their businesses, Father. I'm asking for that thousandfold return in any way you want to give it, Father, to bless them for being obedient. And everybody said? Amen. And I? Amen. Thank you. Amen.
And while they're taking it up, I'm going to finish what I was going to say. <laughs> Is this okay? No matter how hard you ever try, you're not ever going to figure out God. You're just not going to be able to do it. And you might have your little list of things. Well, I'm going to find out why this didn't happen and why this did. It's going to melt. <laughs> your little list, no matter how long people want to hang on to it, whether you're here or you're listening or whatever, forget the list. Let it go. Go on with your future. It's not that important. Uh, however or whatever, your family members are living in heaven. They're enjoying themselves. Okay? They know you're here. They know you're running your race. They're excited about you. They go every day to a portal in heaven on your birthday and sing happy birthday to you. They go get a gift somewhere in heaven, and they put it in your mansion that's being built, and every single year you were a part, they'll have a gift for you when you get to heaven. They don't forget you. They love you even more than they did down here. They're excited about what God's got planned for you. They already know God's will for your life. You know, they don't see all the traumas and devastation down here, but they do declare over you, Father, I declare they'll become mighty women and men of God. I declare they will not miss their destiny. I declare they'll become a, a living testimony of the saving power of Jesus Christ so all your family members who are running are wasting their time. Because if their grandma prayed for them on the earth and she is praying for you in heaven, you may as well lay down and give up. Because God is going to get you. The sooner, the better. Then you can do something for him. Amen? So uh, in charting your course, make sure that you have all of your stuff written down. Make sure you know how far you want to go with him, what your current position is. Do I need to change that? Do I need to change stuff I'm saying? Do I need to change the way I'm treating people? And I can tell you, in this time, he wants you to be kind. Yeah. 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 Be kind, be bold, and live the truth. You can love people, but when you love them, you have to share the truth. Loving people and ignoring what they're doing because you're loving them is not going to help them. You share the truth in love, but you have to share the truth. The truth is what makes you free. And, uh, and God can give you ways to share the truth with people that you never thought of before and, and maybe open them up. You know, bashing them, trashing them, accusing them is not going to work. Not going to work. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do that. Okay, but he also didn't partake of anybody's sin that was going on. We need a balance in our life. The only place you can be extreme in is your extreme, your love for him. Amen? Be extreme in your love for him. Be a priest first. Okay, then you get promoted to a lord and then to a king. And those are eternal positions that never change. You want to know about your positions in eternity? You decide that with your life right now on the earth. When you die, you don't change your position. So instead of just, you know, a vacation planning, college planning, you know, even estate planning, make sure you got eternal planning on your page. Because your ultimate course, no matter when it happens, is going to take you to heaven. Amen? Amen? So plan somewhere in there in your stuff to rule and reign with Christ to make a difference in this world. To be bold, let the Holy Spirit put boldness in you. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, that should be the number one next thing on your list. Before you go anywhere or anything, ask the Holy Spirit to invade your life, to move in on the inside of you. And then you have a whole of him living there. It's not a little piece. You get a whole of him moving in the inside of you. That's why you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay? He's a layered being. He has unlimited layers. When you ask him to come in, he takes a layer of himself and sends it, and it abides in you. It's a whole of him. He knows all your thoughts, all your intentions, but he knows God's plans for you. He knows the blessings God wants to give you. They're waiting for the right words to come out of your mouth. Amen? Amen. Your whole destiny is affected by what you say and what you choose. And so part of your uh, charting... I know when my husband would chart a course, if we were going to go somewhere in, in, in the boats, we, we used to have boats, and I know one day he will have his own marina, 
and uh, he'll be selling boats because that's his delight and that's his gift. But when we had them, he would take all those, you know, those weird ocean charts with 10 million numbers on them and all these little arrows and these little things, lines on them. He understood every bit of that. I didn't. I just knew we were going really far out there. He said, I'm going to take you to the little ocean, and I believed him. No, oh, there's only one ocean, and it's big. It's not little. <laughs> And we were over 50 miles out there. You could not see a thing. There was no land anywhere. I said, well, how big is this little ocean? Because I thought it just went a little ways out, you know? We're not liking the one that goes around the world, right? And he said, oh, I think I got a bite. You know, he would just avoid the answer to that question. And he said, I know exactly where we are. We are right here. This is where we are. This degree is here, here, and here. And this is where we are. And you see that little thing right there, that little box with all the stuff moving on it? Those were fish. And we are here to catch those fish. So this is our course. We plotted it. We went right exactly. I didn't miss it even by an inch. Uh, because I do know that there's a, there's a true north and there's a magnetic north. And if you get on that line with that magnetic north, you could totally miss where you were going to go. This is true north, magnetic north, and if you went this way, you know, for 20 miles, you are way missing where you thought you were going to go. He taught me that much. But I don't ever take the little compass. There's like some kind of a compass thing you, uh, I forgot, I think it's called a rose compass or something. I don't know. I thought that was a flower. I don't know. You know, I just know the, the boat was fun unless we were fishing, and then the bait stunk, and the fish were slimy, and he was really, really happy. And I have a little newsflash from heaven. This is what God says you need to do for your husband. You need to make him happy, let him have a good time, and make him feel important. And if you're not doing all three of those, you're probably not happy, and he's probably not happy. Don't worry so much about what he's not doing. You do those three things. He makes me. I have got to keep my marriage right on mark. Or I can't go do what he's asked me to do. Because no matter how wonderful and powerful it is, he is my number one thing. When I get to heaven, God will not say how many countries did you go to and how many people did you win and how many times did you share heaven. He's going to say, what did you do with your husband? When you're charting your course, don't leave anybody behind. Okay? His job is to love you, cover you, and protect you. That's what he told my husband. Your job is to love your wife, cover her, and protect the treasure that's on the inside of her. He gave us each three things to do. If we're doing those three things, we're great. And I'll give you another tip for this time on the earth. In charting your course, and when you step out, you actually start doing what he called you to do. Uh, you have to trust him. It may look weird, it may look impossible, but if you don't step out, you're never going to do anything like, like he said. You won't go anywhere. 20 years from now, you'll be telling people all the things God said you were doing, we're going to do, but you didn't do it because you didn't do anything. If you step out, even if it's wrong, he will be so excited you're stepping out, he'll make sure that you know you're not doing it right. But you have to have a movement. You have to be going in a forward direction. That's what my husband does. He said, because if you do this, you're going backwards, okay? <laughs> this is backwards. You're not doing anything. You're just going to be stagnant, okay? And if you do this, you're really either stepping back or stepping out of where he had you. This is the motion you need to take. You need to be going forward in your marriage also. And this must be for somebody out there who needs this, okay? You need passionate power in your marriage because that's what God always created us for. There is passionate power available. You protect your children. Your marriage will be great. Your finances will come in. If you're operating in passionate power, and I'm not going to explain what that means because you should know what that means. And if you don't, then you're already in trouble. <laughs> I could do a really good marriage conference if everybody any a ever asked me to come and do one. I would be funny, but I would be really good because I've been married one time to the wrong person who I picked out myself for six years, was in prison until God said, in the contract, he said, when I put you together, it's a covenant. When men put yourself together, it's a contract. Because what his word actually says is, what I put together, let not man put asunder. That's why there are so many divorces. Because people put themselves together. Hello? Let God put you together. Don't become impatient. 
run after Jesus, fall in love with him? Do they have to peel you away from him to marry you? And the same thing with you guys. Run after Jesus. Fall in love with him. Give yourself to him. And to that God has to dangle that female in front of you every way he can to get you to notice her. Your first love should be him. I love Jesus more than anybody. My husband is number two, but he's a really good number two. And if I'm not loving him, I don't get no money. You think I'm not serious? He makes me live the revelations I share. That's why I know they work. He said, if your finances aren't coming in, check out your love life with your spouse. Not somebody else that you're sharing an unclean spirit with. Unclean spirits are over all of that stuff. Unclean spirits are the ugliest, nastiest, milliest, most defiling spirits there are in the earth. And whenever you're partnering with another person who's not your spouse, you hit, they're right there with you. They're right there with you. And if you could see them, you'd run. Amen? You need to stay true to who God gave you to. And even if you married someone that maybe wasn't the right one, God will still receive them as your spouse. But you honor them, you love them, you pray for them, okay? Say yes. Because no matter how awesome your vision is that he gave you as a person, maybe he gave you that before your spouse came and you're thinking, will I ever, well, if you write for the right one, then you will surely finish that because God told me 40 years ago what I would be doing, not the heaven thing, but the, the next thing in my life. I have another 30 year vision when this one is done, whenever that is, I'm not going anywhere. I'll stay till he takes me home, however long that is. I have no plans to die. I've got no funeral plans. Because I'm planning to live. Does that sound crazy? That's how well I know him. Because if he's got someone to be bold and willing to walk around with pink hair where you cannot hide from anybody and tell you all the wild, amazing things from heaven and not care, it doesn't hurt me when people trash me, bash me on, on the Internet. Please pray for them and love them. Okay, that's what I, I, I say. I love you, and you're precious, and God loves you, and I'm going to pray for you, but you're banned. But I love you. You're banned. We ban people. We don't want them messing up what God's releasing on our websites. You know, why give the devil a place to use them, which he wants to do? You know, you can be kind, but ban them. Amen? He wants to keep those. Why do, why do I, we let people make comments? You, you have a mind. You have a right to say something, but you have no right to bash anybody. Not me, not the people who want the revelation. And if that's what your plan is, then you're not going to be allowed. But may God consume you, catch you up to heaven, take you to passionate paradise, duck you down a few more times, show you hell, <laughs> and bring you back, and maybe you will change. Amen? <laughs> maybe he'll put pink hair on you. <laughs> heaven loves pink hair. And the Holy Spirit says it makes my blue eyes pop. And no, I do not wear contacts. These are my real eyes. And they have seen the face of God. You know, people are always saying, okay, I'm writing you off right now. I liked everything you said. You said you saw God. That's it. I'm wiping you off. May he take you and you stand in his glory and see the, see the living love that comes out of his face and his blue eyes of fire and hold you in his arms. Do you feel like you're going to melt and go inside of him? <laughs> if you belong to Jesus Christ and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, then you can see your daddy's face anytime he chooses to show it to you because the pure in heart shall see God. And by the way, his front and his back are both glorious. His back is no less glorious than his front. And when he showed Moses himself, what he was saying to Moses is, I will hide you in the secret place inside of me and as I pass, I will show you all of history that has gone before your time. 
How about that? Moses was his friend. He had to show him the past so he could write the book of Genesis. How would he know how to write that? Because he saw it. I will hide you in the secret place, and as I pass by, I will show you all the hinder parts, the parts behind me, which is time. He took him back in time and showed him all of that stuff. And he did that to more than one person in the Bible. John was taken back and shown Jesus when he was the word. How could he say he was the word and was with God and was God and he was made flesh, but he showed him because he had a hunger inside that burned to know him more. And so he gave him the more. Amen? Amen. So don't believe that whole religious thing that says you cannot see the face of God and live. He's caught unbelievers up and shown him himself. Let me tell you, when they came back, they got saved. Amen? Amen. So I, I was going to lay hands on everybody tonight, but I think I may do it tomorrow night because I know we've got important meetings in the morning. I do not want anyone to miss what Joan has to say. God speaks to everybody like he speaks to me. We all have a part to share. Okay, my mountains I'm taking for God in this earth will affect the government, but it will be focused on entertainment and media. Amen? Amen. Creating fun new things in the earth. I'm already writing movie scripts for Hollywood. Yes, they want them. I have met with producers. Uh, I've already got my first title. And it'll be a three-part series that will take you before time. It's going to take you where you are now. And it's going to take you back in time. It's going to take you into the future. You'll see the spirit realm and the physical realm all at the same time in all of these movies. And people will get born again. Amen. So let's stand up, and I'm going to give you an impartation from here. Amen. And then we will be back at our tables. Um, not to have a meeting. <laughs> yeah, and tomorrow night, um, tomorrow, when Joan comes up and gives her stuff away, I'm going to give her some of my stuff to give away. So make sure you don't miss tomorrow, and oh my goodness, you know, all the rest of the speakers, and I'm looking forward to hearing Doug Addison and laugh till my stomach hurts. Because his good friend Steve Schultz told, him, told me all about him. And uh, Steve Schultz called me. I'm like his new best friend. I have a lot of new best friends. And he said, oh, you need to know him. He will make you laugh so hard your stomach will hurt. I said, then I'm looking forward to that because I like to laugh. Amen? Amen. So hold up your hands. Father, right now, I just impart into your people, your children. I like to call them children because we're your children. I thank you, Father, that let them become more childlike. I declare and impart into them the ability to be like a child, to have a greater trust, to obey better, because when you obey and you trust, it will all be okay. Yeah. Say, I receive it. I receive it. Amen. Thank you for letting me share. May the host go with you.